Mr. Schiff. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Peter Schiff, and I guess you can say I am in the economic and financial gloom and doom business. And thanks to this body, uh, President Obama, the Federal Reserve, business is booming. And, you know, I, I would rather profit from America's success rather than her failure, which is the reason that I'm here today. We have some serious structural problems underlying the U.S. economy, and we cannot solve them until we understand them. As a nation, we have borrowed and spent our way into a gigantic ditch. We are not going to get out of the ditch by digging it deeper. We have to reverse the mistakes of the past, not repeat them. Government stimulus will never grow this economy. It will never create jobs. <clears throat> it is the equivalent of trying to put out a fire by pouring gasoline on it. We have to understand that the housing bubble, the financial crisis of 2008, two events that I predicted and warned about, were the consequences of government stimulus. We stimulated our way into this problem. We are not going to stimulate our way out. In fact, the stimulus is actually a sedative. The stimulus is preventing the free market from unraveling the problems that years of bad monetary and fiscal policy have created. We don't need more spending. We need the opposite of spending. We need underconsumption. What the economy lacks is savings, investment, production. And if we try to preserve the jobs of the bubble economy with more reckless money printing and borrowing and government spending, all we are going to succeed in doing is preventing the restructuring that we need and preventing more productive jobs from ever coming into existence. And I want to talk, you know, specifically about jobs. I'm an employer. I employ about 150 people. I would probably employ 1,000 more if it weren't for government regulations that have inhibited my ability to hire and grow my business and have forced me to move for portions of my business overseas in order to escape the regulatory burden here. But the question is, why do I hire people? Where are these jobs coming from? You know, jobs in a free market, uh, they come from two things. They come from profits or the profit motive, and they come from capital. You need both to create jobs. And in a free market, there's going to be jobs. And if there aren't enough jobs, Congress has to ask, what are we doing to inhibit this process? How are we preventing jobs that would normally be here from coming into existence? Now, in order for me to hire somebody, I have to be able to make a profit. That means that the person I hire has to deliver to me more value than the cost of employing them. And the cost of employing them is not just the wages I pay them, but it's all the mandatory benefits, the taxes, and more importantly, the legal liability that I incur when I hire somebody. In fact, one of the riskiest things you can do in America is to hire somebody. And because of that reason, because of all the liability, uh, from government, from lawsuits that you have put on employers. Most small businesses, the, their main concern is how not to hire people. How can I grow my business and hire as few people as possible? That is not something that happens in the market. That is something that happens as a consequence of government. The other thing that you need to create jobs, in addition to profit, is capital. People work for me because I have capital. I have tools that my employees lack. They come to work, I give them an office. I give them secretarial support, I, I give them computers, I give them leads, I give them a brand, I give them all sorts of things. But where does capital come from? It comes from savings. It comes from underconsumption. Either I have to save it myself or I have to borrow it from somebody else. But there is no money to borrow because it's all going to government or something that government guarantees, like education or home mortgages. Uh, there is no credit available uh, for small businesses. It's actually a paradox, but what we need is higher interest rates. Higher interest rates encourage savings. These low interest rates are of no benefit to typical businesses. Yeah, it benefits government. Government can borrow all this money through the bond market. Some of the major corporations have access to cheap money. Wall Street can gamble with it. But small businesses, they can't sell bonds. They need to borrow money. Uh, and there's no savings available. There is nothing there. So businesses can't get capital, and there is no incentive now to hire because the costs are too high. You're looking at somebody who's sitting here who was actually fined, and I'd be happy to talk my experience. I was fined $15,000 by security regulators because I hired too many people. Because I hired too many people, I incurred over $500,000 in legal bills defending myself because I hired too many people. Because I hired too many people, I've been on a hiring freeze ordered by regulators for three years. They have not let me hire people. They have not let me open new offices, despite the fact that I was dying to do it. I had plenty of demand. My business was growing, unfortunately, thanks to what you guys were doing. But 
regulators prohibited me from doing this. And there's all sorts of ways that rules and regulations have inhibited my business. In fact, it's now so expensive. I started my securities firm in, in 1996. There is no way that I could have started that firm today. I have an entire compliance department. It costs me millions of dollars a year just to stay in business, just to comply with rules and regulations that are not doing anything to protect my customers. Thank you, Mr. Chef. We appreciate that uh, good testimony. Thank you. Dr. Boucher. Well, I want to make three quick points. Um, first, on the issue of regulations, I think we need to be very careful that we are very specific about what we are talking about. In today's New York Times, for example, there was an article about whether or not the FDA would regulate new forms of E. coli in our hamburgers. Now, that creates a level playing field, so every producer knows that everyone else needs to make sure that they are not allowing hazardous um, foods. That is an important regulation, and certainly it costs businesses money, but that is important for consumer health. I don't know when I see that hamburger what is inside of it. That is critical. So this sort of blanket regulatory stuff, we need to dig down deep into that. Second, um, you know, we had an over 8 percent drop in GDP because of the crisis. That is a massive hole to fill. And I concur with uh, my colleagues over here that, you know, it may have been that the housing bubble was at an elevated level of um, demand flowing through the economy because of the housing bubble, but that doesn't change the fact that when you pull it out of the economy, you have a gaping hole and that's left 14 million people out of work. It is that hole that government spending is the only entity right now can fill unless we are going to dramatically increase our experts. Very quickly, my third point. Around this uncertainty question, certainly there is always uncertainty in the economy. But I think we should have been asking ourselves in the early 2000s how we were going to pay for those massive tax cuts that we did when we were also funding two, having two unfunded wars. I didn't hear as much discussion around that then, but those are the kinds of questions we should have been asking and a part of why we are here today. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Chair. Sure. Well, first of all, you know, um, <clears throat> Demand doesn't come from government spending. Inflation comes from government spending. Demand comes from supply. You can't consume something that isn't produced. So uh, that's uh, we have to make things first. But as far as regulations are concerned, certainly we we need to stop piling new regulations on top of the existing regulations. But more importantly, we got to start repealing a lot of the rules and regulations that are already in place. Look, there are millions of Americans that are unemployed. How do we decrease increase the demand for labor? It's simple. You bring down the cost of labor regulations substantially increase the cost of employing people, yep. and as a result, fewer people are employed. I mean, there are simple things you can do from getting rid of the minimum wage law, which you could do this afternoon, uh, which would create millions of jobs, and more importantly, you know, help people get trained for much higher paying jobs in the future. Right now, you know, they, they're never going to get jobs. But the, the, the regulations that increase labor costs and that subject employers to all sorts of lawsuits if they don't create jobs in precisely the manner that some bureaucrat thinks they should be created. You have to let level the playing field between employers and employees. You can't lose your rights because you hire somebody. You can't give workers some kind of special privilege and then call it a worker's rights. Workers don't have special rights because they get a job. Everybody has individual rights, and you shouldn't lose them because you hire somebody. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's get this right. China is about to build a hundred airports, and we are spending we're spending less than a half a percent on our infrastructure. Something's wrong. But I, I would love to address some of the points that Mr. Cummings make, make it real quick, if you could, Mr. Schiff, because I want to get to. Um, well, he made so many points, but you know, you're right about one thing: that the, the bad regulation didn't start under Obama. We have a lot of, of regulations that need to be undone. But it's not just the intent. I don't argue with you that in some cases the intent of the regulation is good. The problem is the consequences are the exact opposite of the of the intent. And infrastructure, you know, infrastructure spending doesn't stimulate the economy. It drains the economy of resources. Infrastructure only helps in the long run when you finish the project if it raises the productivity of the nation. But in the meantime, we are too broke. China can put in these airports because they are rich. We are broke. Before we can afford to improve the infrastructure, we need to have more serious restructuring of our economy. We have to start making stuff. We need more factories before we can start figuring out how to make our roads prettier. You can say what you want about the stimulus bill, but I can bring a whole, I can bring this, a room full of people who will tell you that they were not able, if, if it were not for the stimulus bill, they would not have had jobs. I know that it has, 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 it effect, has its effect. I think that any stimulus type of action needs to be very carefully planned. I need, 
and I think it needs to be very targeted. I mean, you know, Mr. Cummings pointed about he can, you know, when people get a stimulus job, he can see those jobs. Yeah, you can always see the jobs that government creates. What you don't see are the jobs that they destroyed to create those jobs. All the government can do is rearrange the resources. It doesn't create any wealth. But the problem is, is the jobs or the wealth that gets destroyed is more productive than whatever the government replaces it with. And so on balance, the country is poor as a result of that. And it doesn't, you know, the fact that if we send out a stimulus check, it's not going to stimulate the economy. If an American goes and buys some more products that were made in China, how does that help our economy? It runs up the trade deficit, and now we had to go deeper into debt to stand, spend that stimulus check. All of that is counterproductive. And we're going to continue to repeat these mistakes. We're going to keep on throwing gasoline on this fire until we incinerate the entire country. That was the deal. I would argue Standard & Poor's downgraded this because of the, the lack of the deal, the agreement addressing how serious this situation is. And, to, and for, to insinuate that, oh, it was because Congress had a vigorous debate, I thought that's what we're supposed to do in Congress, right? Congress is certainly supposed to have a vigorous yes, debate. Exactly. Part of the puzzle, though, was that this Congress refused to put raising taxes, especially on the wealthy, as a part of that package. And that would have been an important way to get to the goal that SP wanted. I mean, you said. And an important way to tax the people who create jobs, too. And, yeah. and that caused the crisis. Yeah. Mr. Schiff. It, it was and definitely I'm, I'm it was get the good doctor from Tennessee next. Definitely the deal, not the discussion. And you know, with due respect, you know, I, I did uh, call the, the financial bubble and I, I criticized SP and Moody's and Fitch at the time for putting AAA ratings on bonds that I knew were going to go to zero. And in my opinion, SP didn't downgrade the United States far enough. That's the problem. Uh, let me just say this. I, I've read this 50 million times. Their concern was that there were members of Congress that were going around talking about letting, not raising the debt ceiling. That's what they, that was one of their major concerns, and saying we don't, we don't have to do that. That's, that, that's, that's what, what you should have done. If you, if you didn't raise the debt ceiling, then we could have cut spending. So you said that we were paying our bills. We don't pay our bills by going deeper into debt. That's avoiding paying our bills and guaranteeing eventual default. For, let me interrupt. Do we tax too little or do we spend too much as a government? I mean, look at our, look at our deficit. Rel exactly. Relative to other countries. We are a relative low tax country, and we are not a relative. Are high we spender. a high spending country? No, we're not. No, well, not how did relative, we get not relative to our GDP and relative to other countries. No, I mean I could, I will, I'm, I would be more than happy after this to okay. send you well, a series of charts that document this. Mr. Schiff, do you have a comment on that? Sure, Mike. So, Mr. Schiff. Yeah, what, what percentage of my income should the government take? What, what do you think would be fair? I'm, I'm not going to give well, you a number. Well, just give me right a guess. Here. Yeah. Well, just, I just, what do you think would be fair? You say we're not, I'm not paying enough taxes. How, how high should my taxes be? What percentage of my income should be taken away from me by the government? We have a progressive income tax right, but just What do you think would have half, 60 percent, 70 percent? How much should they take? Wow. Well, gonna, well gonna, that is so gonna, far beyond. Well, well, we're gonna, wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. But just, hang on, hang on. Yeah, hang let on. me say that, you know, well, tax, tax the, gentleman, rich, the gentleman from Tennessee well, has the time. Uh, yeah, I'll just interrupt. You know, taxing the rich is a great idea until the rich run out of money, and that seems well, to be no, the my problem process. Is I'm already almost paying half on my income in taxes hey, right now. That is impossible. Well, it's not impossible. No, it's not. Okay, this, this, let me, Mr. Chairman. Um, let, let's, let's shift no, gears no, for one second, hey, because no, this no, is going to go on forever. Uh, uh, Dr. Boucher, do you feel that government, Dr. Boucher, do you feel that government jobs create revenue? And I think you said that the Stimulus One had uh, the majority of jobs created were private sector jobs. Do public jobs create revenue, or do they just cost the taxpayers money? Recovery dollars that have gone, the dollars that go into communities to, say, build a bridge, you hire engineers, typically in the private sector, some in the public, some in the private. You hire contractors. You hire people that do concrete. You hire a lot of folks in the private sector, and then that has spillover effects. So that if you, you hire that person who has the concrete, and then they go and they have more money, and so they spend it in their community, that is how those private sector jobs are created, Dr. Schiff, directly you, and directly. Mr. Schiff, do you feel that is a good return on your investment to spend those tax dollars that way? I mean, what is your chance of making a profit? Well, first I want to point out that, you know, 99 percent of my income is taxed at the marginal rate. So the marginal rate is my rate. And if the Federal Government has taken 35 percent of my income and then another 3 percent for, 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 for Medicare, that is 38, and then when I have the State of Connecticut now almost 7 percent, I am over 45 percent of my income in, in tax, and that is before I pay any property taxes or sales taxes or anything else like that. And if you raise my taxes much more, I'm, that's it. I'm done. 
you know, I'm already moving businesses to Singapore, moving businesses uh, to the Caribbean uh, to try to go to lower tax jurisdictions. We are not a low tax country. We are a high tax country, and we are a much higher tax country than we used to be in the past by far. It takes two to tango. I mean, you can only borrow if somebody is saving. There has to be a lender on the other side of that transaction. It, there has to be something in it for the lender. You have to have higher interest rates. The problem is the banks are just getting money for, uh, from the Federal Reserve and turning around and buying treasuries with it. That is not going to grow the economy. That is going to grow the, the government. But meanwhile, these monetary policies are stifling the savings that we need to grow the economy. Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Schiff. Yeah, well, ideally, you would abolish the corporate tax completely. I mean, corporations don't pay the taxes. Their shareholders pay the taxes. So tax them at the shareholder level. The employees pay the taxes when they, when they, when they get paid. But again, ideally, we would have no income tax. We would have no payroll tax. If the Federal Government needs revenue, let it raise it through a national sales tax. It would be much more conducive uh, to tax people when they spend their wealth, not when they accumulate it. I agree with you know, all that. The argument is always that, well, if we only tax uh, uh, spending, uh, the rich don't spend all their money, precisely. The money they don't spend is what grows the economy. That is what produces the jobs. If they are not spending the money, it is benefiting everybody but the rich. The rich enjoy their wealth when they spend it, and so that is a much better time to tax it. But as far as your, your budget plan, I think Congress is, is, is much underestimating how much time we have to deal with this crisis. I think there is a sovereign debt crisis and a currency crisis coming to this country soon maybe even before the next election. And that will be far more catastrophic to our economy uh, than what happened in 2008. Well said. I, mean, I couldn't, the window of time to fix this is closing very rapidly, and it's, it just underscores how serious it is. Mr. Well, most top economists are saying that the President's uh, American Jobs Act will boost the economy and create jobs. And Mark Zandi, uh, chief economist for Moody's Analytics, is forecasting a 1.9 million job boost and a 2 percent lift for GDP if the President's package is passed as proposed. Um, this 2 percent tax uh, cut, Mr. Schiff, you you're in agreement with that, that, that payroll? No. You, you're, you're in disagreement with that? I think the deficits that will be created to finance that tax cut will do more damage to undermine this economy and destroy jobs than any benefit uh, we will get from the extra income being spent. The problem is the damage that the government does to the economy is not limited to taxation. It is spending. It is what the government is spending that is damaging the economy. And so if we run deficits instead of taxes, we actually do more damage. Deficit spending is more detrimental to the economy than taxation. I got you. But what we need to do is dramatically reduce government spending. I that got is it. the only we need stimulus to, uh, that will well, work. Well, we'll disagree on that. I think we need to do both. I don't think that there is any member of Congress that does not believe that we need to do both. Mr. Boucher, what is your opinion on that? Um, you know, it is hard to imagine how spending um, uh, you know, that right now when interest rates are at historic lows, when people still want to buy U.S. Treasuries, when um, we have this massive unmet need in terms of both infrastructure but all of the massive layoffs that have happened in education around America because of the state and local budget crunches, that those that using government dollars right now for those, it is hard to understand how that is not um, a, a easy for us to do because we can afford it, and B, that that does not help our economy. Having, you know, children in school, school in school rooms in places across the country with 40 children is not good for America's future. It is not good for America's workforce. We can do something to fix that. We can borrow at historic low rates, and we can pay it back as the economy gets back on track. And I would like to take issue with one thing that Mr. Schiff said earlier, which is that America can't afford it. America remains one of the richest countries on the planet. To say that we cannot afford to make these investments right now when our economy needs it most and get 14 million people back to work is, quite frankly, absurd. We can afford it. It is just how we are using our resources. We, we, we can afford it. And, and the problem is interest rates are low now. They are not going to stay low. We have got a $15 trillion national debt financed with Treasury bills. It is the same mistake that people made who were taking out subprime mortgages. What is going to happen when rates are at 5 percent or 10 percent? What is going to happen when interest on the national debt consumes 100 percent of Federal tax receipts? That can happen in just a few years. Interest rates got to 20 percent in 1980. What happens if they go Madam, there again? Madam Chair, I see my time is up, but I just want to need 15 seconds to say this. You know, one of the things that we've got to do, we have got to invest in our people. If you've got kids, one of the greatest threats 
to our national security is our failure to properly educate every single one of our children. That's the greatest threat. Well, the and if we have to spend now to educate our children so that they can take over this world, innovate, uh, create jobs, and do the right thing, fine. But At the rate we're going, though, if we're not careful, we will, we will implode from the inside. But because the we're problem not is doing all the things we need to do now. We're spending and not that, educating. We don't that, need more spending on education. We're spending too much, and kids are not getting educated. We need more on-the-job training. Unfortunately, we have too many kids going to college on government grants. It's bit up the price into the stratosphere. And we have all these kids graduating with huge mortgages and no houses and no marketable skills. I am, I'm saddened by those comments. Well, Thank you, I'm Mr. I'm saddened by what, those, by what those programs have done to our young people. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. I yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. And the artificially low rates that we're working with today. Any type of an, an idea or a scenario, what could happen when these rates that are being kept artificially low, and we know for the next, at least until the election, uh, there's going to be a low prime rate, but when it rises to what it should be, market value, the effect that it's going to have on businesses. Well, I mean, the, the, the problem, the artificially low interest rates right now are one of the main problems that the economy has, and I think we are pursuing those rates to prop up uh, insolvent banks, uh, to uh, necessitate the, the government bubble, the big the borrowing from the Federal Government. And when interest rates ultimately rise, all the banks that you guys bailed out, they are all going to fail again because they are insolvent. They are only, they're only kept afloat uh, by the cheap money from the Fed. Their portfolios are loaded up with low-yielding, long-term mortgages and government bonds. And when interest rates go up, the value of those assets will collapse. But they have to go up, because eventually the dollar will sink so much, prices will rise so much, nobody will lend us money. The dollar won't be the reserve currency. Right now it is kind of benefiting from the fact that there are problems in other parts of the world. But look at the price of gold. It is at $1,900 an ounce for a reason. Right? It is going up because of all the inflation that we are creating now and all the inflation that we are going to have to create in order to keep interest rates at these low levels. And the only way to solve our problems is to let interest rates go up. And they are going to go way up. And then what are we going to do? I mean, if we keep inflating this bubble, if we let the national debt get to $20 trillion and then rates go to 10 or 20 percent, you know, what people are saying now is exactly what they said during the real estate bubble. People used to tell me, Peter, you are crazy. Real estate prices will never fall. Mm. Well, now we know what happened. People are now saying the same thing with interest rates. We don't have to worry because interest rates will never rise. They will stay low forever. They won't. No, and, and you're right. The only thing we know for sure is they're not going to rise before the next election. Well, we don't know that for sure. They're going to try everything they well, can to prevent it. And the other thing that's going to happen is we print money that isn't backed by anything. Our lenders are going to say at some point, you're paying me back with money that isn't worth what I yeah, lent you. We're destroying the value of our money, and that's why prices are rising. Oil prices aren't going up. You know, in fact, Ron Paul pointed out in, in that, his last debate, you can buy a gallon of gasoline for a dime, as long as you have a dime that was minted before 1965. It's because our money is being debased by, by the Federal Reserve, and that's what's happening. Prices aren't going anywhere. The value of our money is declining, and it's going to lose a lot more value in a very short period of time if we continue these policies. And, and the President's new plan, there's a $4,000 incentive for hiring people who have been unemployed for long periods of time. For somebody like yourself who is an employer and somebody who, like myself who is an employer who interviews people, are we picking winners and losers as to who it is we are going to hire? Yeah. Well, absolutely. In fact, this is another example of things that are going to backfire. The government is proposing a plan to make it illegal for employers to discriminate against people who have been unemployed for more than six months. The effect of this is going to be is nobody is going to interview anybody who has been unemployed for more than six months because they don't want to risk a lawsuit. All this plan is going to do is going to mean if, I w if somebody was going to hire somebody anyway, they will try to hire somebody who is, they will try to interview people who have been unemployed for about five months so they can start them at the six months so they can get the tax credit. But it is simply going to shift jobs away from people who are newly unemployed or long-term unemployed to people who have been unemployed for a specific period of time. I think the most it is going to do is influence minimum wage, because basically I said earlier that we should abolish the minimum wage. What that $4,000 tax credit does is temporarily substantially reduce the minimum wage for a six-month period of time. So I think on the margin you will create some minimum wage type jobs on a temporary basis, but it is not going to be any kind of great stimulus. And as I said, the deficits that we will generate to finance the tax cuts will destroy more jobs than those tax cuts create. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I now recognize Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Schiff, you have made a very strong case about cutting government spending. Does that 
include the Pentagon and ending the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? It absolutely includes that. Okay. In fact, I, I would thank put you. that thank high you. on the agenda. I, I've, got, I've just got a <laughs> few. Thank you very much. I just want to sort of pick up where uh, Mr. Kucinich uh, left off, and that is with regards to these economic theories and what works and what doesn't work. Um, Professor Taylor, if you wanted to finish up and then we would maybe just move down the panel, um, there seems to be disagreement, and I would like to hear your perspectives as what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, I wanted to uh, point out, you know, Mr. Kucinich, unfortunately, he left, but uh, he made the point that uh, prior stimuluses uh, had enjoyed bipartisan support. Well, they didn't enjoy my support. I opposed them at the time. All of the efforts by government in the past to artificially stimulate the economy have failed. They have worsened the problem. You know, the recession is actually part of the cure. The recession needs to be allowed to run its course. The reason we are never going to have a real recovery is because the government won't let us have a real recession. We have serious economic imbalances that I mentioned. We have an economy that is based on spending borrowed money. That can't be. Economies have to be based on savings and investment and production. We are trying to run an economy upside down. And in order to maintain it, we have to keep interest rates at zero. We have to run these huge imbalances. We have to import all these goods that we don't produce. We have to borrow from the rest of the world. We have to allow the restructuring to take place. And still that happens. All, and still we allow that to happen. We are not going to create jobs. We are not going to have any real economic growth. We can't just keep repeating the mistakes. But I know and this is a political body, it is very difficult for politicians to level with the American public about how severe these problems are and how they are the consequence of years and years of mistakes made by Congress and by the Federal Reserve. There is a free market cure. It will work if the government gets out of the way and lets it happen. It is going to be painful, you know, just like anyone who has a drug habit. They check into rehab. They will come out better. But it is not going to work if every time they feel the withdrawal symptoms, they take another shot of heroin, because that is what these stimuluses are. It is a shot of monetary or fiscal heroin, and it is not going to work. And it only means that the eventual withdrawal is that much more painful, because we got that much more drugs in the system that have to come out. Thank you very much. And I guess I will ask a closing question because it is rhetorical, but it is important, uh, I think, to the way I think, and, and perhaps your comments will help everyone. How many of you out of five believe Henry Ford did a service to America in automating and increasing the productivity at Ford plants uh, during his tenure in the Model T and Model A? He certainly did. One of the things we can all agree on. Isn't isn't that part of the challenge we face today, is if you can produce a better product for less, which also includes less labor, that that is how you end up being a world-class creator of jobs? Isn't that the principle that, for some reason, stimulus, simply adding jobs by paying for them, does the exact opposite of less labor, perhaps, but world-class labor that produces a better product for yeah. the U.S. Mr. Schiff. Absolutely. In fact, to point out, you know, Henry Ford was famous for paying his workers $5 a day. Highest in the world at the time. Yeah, but that was an ounce and a quarter of gold, which at today's exchange rate is $2,500 a week. So Ford's workers were making $2,500 a week, the equivalent. They were paying no Federal income taxes and no payroll taxes. There was no minimum wage and there were no unions. We paid the highest wages in the world, yet we produced the best quality, least expensive products. How was that possible? That was because we had the smallest government. We had minimal regulations, low taxes. And if we want to recreate American industry, we have to recreate that environment. We have to allow businesses to grow and prosper, and we have to remove all the roadblocks and the impediments that Congress has placed in their path over the years. Dr. Boucher, you are sort of surrounded here, so I will give you the last word. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, I am glad that Mr. Schiff brought up the $5 a day. That was an important uh, point. Um, the reason that Henry Ford did that, of course, was to reduce turnover and to keep highly skilled workers. So um, that certainly tells you something. And um, it would be great to see more employers taking that high road strategy today that we don't see enough here in America. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Issa. I would like to thank all of our witnesses for coming here today and taking time out of your busy schedules. We appreciate that very much. And at this time, this hearing stands adjourned.